Section 15 of Roman History, The Early Empire by William Wolfe Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 7, Otho, A.D. 69. Marcus Salvius Otho began in early youth a wild and dissolute career. To gain a footing in the palace, he paid his court to an old waiting maid of influence, and before long became one of the most prominent of the set of young roisterers who surrounded Nero. He rose to be the chief friend and confidant of the young prince, encouraged him in his worst excesses, was privy even to his mother's murder, and gave the luxurious supper which lulled her fears to rest. He relied too much, however, on his influence, and presumed to be the emperor's rival, for the heart of Popeia Sabina, after giving her his hand and home to cloak Nero's wanton love. To cover his disgrace and check the scandalous gossip of the city, he was appointed to official duties in Lusitania, where for ten years his equity and self-restraint were a marked contrast to the infamy of his early and later life. In Galba's rise to power he saw his opportunity of return, and he exhausted all his arts of flattery and address in the attempt to win the old man's favor, with the further hope that he might take the place which the emperor's death would soon vacate. That hope once baffled, he calmly laid his plans and swept away without compunction the obstacles that barred his road to power. On the evening of the day when Galba fell, he made his way across the blood-stained forum to the palace, while the senate in a hurried meeting passed all the usual votes of honour for their new prince. The populace were ready with their cheers and pressed him to take the name of Nero in memory of the revels of his youth. But the real power was in the soldiers' hands, and they watched with jealous care the puppet they had set upon the throne. He had nothing of the soldier's bearing, was effeminate in look and carriage, with beardless face and an ungainly walk. Yet strange to say they loved him well, and were loyal to him to the last. They kept watch and ward with anxious care that no evil might befall him. They once flew to arms in groundless panic when he was seated with his friends at dinner, forced their way even to his presence, to make sure that their favorite was safe and when he died some slew themselves in their despair, as the dog dies upon his master's grave. Otho could refuse them nothing. He let them choose their own commanders, listened readily to all their grievances, gave them freely all they asked for, and had recourse to subterfuges to rescue from their clutches some whom he wished to spare. He had soon need of all their loyalty, for even before Galba's death, the armies of the Rhine had hailed as emperor their general Vitellius, and their legions were already on the march for Rome. For they were weary of the monotony of constant drill and border camps, and flushed with triumph at the ease with which they had crushed the hopes of Vindex. They cast greedy eyes on the wealth of Gaul and were jealous of the privileged Praetorians. They felt their power and longed to use it, now that the fatal secret had been learnt that emperors were not made at Rome alone. So leaving Vitellius himself to follow slowly with the levies newly raised, two armies made their way to Italy with Valens and Caecina at their head, and crossing the Alps by different passes, after spreading terror among the peoples of Gaul and of Helvetia, met at last upon the plains of Lombardy. Letters meantime had passed between Vitellius and Otho, in which each urged the other to abate his claims and to take anything short of the imperial power. From promises they passed to threats, and thence to plots. Each sent assassins to destroy the other, and each failed to gain his end. But the legions of the north came daily nearer, and Otho lost no time in mustering his forces, and showed an energy of which few had thought him capable. He could count upon the army in the east where Vespasian was acting in his name. The nearer legions in Pannonia and Dalmatia were true to him, and would soon be ready to join the forces that he led from Rome. So, with such household troops as he could gather, and the questionable contingent of two thousand gladiators, he set out to meet the enemy and to appeal to the decision of the sword. 
With him there went perforce many of the chief officers of state, the senators of consular rank, nobles and knights of high position, some proud of their gay arms and trappings, but raw and timid soldiers for the most part, thinking often more of the pleasures of the table than of the real business of war. But their presence in the camp gave moral support to Otho's cause, and lessened the danger of disaffection in the rear. His most skilful generals urged delay till his distant forces could come up from Illyria or the east, but his soldiers were rash and headstrong, and flushed by slight successes at first over Caecina, accused their chiefs of treachery. His confidants were inexperienced and sanguine, and Otho would not wait. He had not the nerve to bear suspense, nor yet to brave the crash of battle. So weakening his army by the withdrawal of his guard, he retired to Brixellum, Brescia, to wait impatiently for the result and to send messages in quick succession to urge his generals to fight without delay. The armies met in the shock of battle on the plains near Bedriacum, where Otho's best generals, forced to fight against their will, were the first to leave the field, and his ill-led and mutinous soldiers broke and fled. But the poor gladiators stood their ground and died almost to a man. The fugitives from the field of battle soon brought the tidings to Brixellum, and Otho saw that all was over. His guards indeed boasted of their loyal love, and urged him to live and to renew the struggle, and told him of his distant armies on the march. But he had staked his all upon a single battle, and he knew that he must pay his losses. He was sick, perhaps, of civil bloodshed, though the fine words which Tacitus ascribes to him sound strangely in the mouth of one who plotted against Galba and gloated over Piso's death. He waited one more day to let the senators retire, who had reluctantly followed him to war, and to save Virginius from the blind fury of the soldiers, or perhaps with some faint lingering hope of rescue. He spent one more night, we know not in what thoughts, upon his bed, and at the dawn took up his dagger and died by his own hand. It was certainly no hero's death. The meanest of that day, the poor gladiator of the stage, could face death calmly when his hour was come, and reigns of terror and the Stoic's creed had long made suicide a thing of course to every weary or despairing soul. Yet so rare were the lessons of unselfishness in high places that men thought it noble in him to risk no more his soldiers' lives, painted with a loving hand the picture of his death, and whispered that his bold stroke for empire was perhaps the act not of an unscrupulous adventurer, but of a republican who wished to restore his country's freedom. End of section 15